to rise in body and their spirit for our opening hymn, I'm on my way. And I'm going to echo what he said, invite the choir members and anybody else who feels like to sing the echo part, which just repeats what he sings, okay? So when they sing, I'm on my way, we sing, I'm on my way. Feel free to join me. numbers up, you know, for my count. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Reverend Jay Wool in the ministry here at the Unitarian Universalists of Sarasota, and it's great to be with you all today. We are like mail deliverers, no matter rain nor sleet nor snow, well, not snow here. <laughs> we show up. So we especially want to welcome our visitors today. Just walking around this morning, I saw a number of you, men number of you, uh, and as well, both on campus, but also visitors who might be online on live stream. And we want to invite you to participate in any of the events that are happening here. And there are many. Uh, so please read your newsletter. Um, and we want to uh, welcome you to, you know, if you want to get a newsletter, to please sign up either online. Uh, there's a place online in the front page of UUSRQ.org or right out front here at the welcome table. You can sign and you will get our weekly newsletter and occasional other emails with Zoom links to online programming. As well, we invite you to join, uh, to join us for coffee and snacks after the service uh, for a good conversation uh, as we all look forward to getting to know each other. We have a few announcements today. Uh, the Arts Council uh, is pleased to present the photographs of Laura Campbell. Laura is a retired professional graphic designer and a fine arts enthusiast and our pedestal artist. 
is Betty Gert. Be I hope I pronounced that right. Betty is not only a watercolor artist, but also a sculptor. So uh, after the service, there will be um, a little ceremony welcoming the artists in the Lexow uh, Gallery, which is right across from the sanctuary here. And also, after service, in the Reeb Room, which is on this wall here, they, I know everybody keeps saying east and west, all I know it's this wall over here. Um, and we will be talking about the mission, the proposed mission and vision um, that the board has approved to come to a vote in our March annual meeting as well. So if you have any questions or you want to hear about the process, um, you want to give feedback, we are welcome, um, and we will be there to answer your questions or any other questions that you may have. Uh, next Saturday is our event for unveiling the rem uh, of the Remembrance Project uh, that uh, talks about lynchings in Sarasota County. Uh, after, the, uh, after counting all the tickets, we were told it was, we were oversold, but there are 20 extra tickets that are being set aside uh, specifically for members of this congregation. And so uh, please see uh, Dale uh, in the courtyard after service. Area. Dale, are you here? Okay, stand up so everybody can see who you are. They find him after service if you'd like a ticket. And then last but not least, I had this um, thrown on the um, pulpit here. Uh, tonight at 7, uh, seven o'clock, I believe. Yes, 7 o'clock. Uh, Peacemakers at a Time of War, uh, uh, an organization called Roots, is a local Palestinian-Israeli initiative for understanding nonviolence and transformation. And it is free. All are attending. Help, help us cross the divide of conversation. And now, after enough talking, <laughs> it is my great honor uh, to introduce Bree Rivera, who will be our special guest musician today. Thank you. still muted. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot with a pink hotel, a boutique and a swinging hot spot. Don't it always seem to go you don't know what you got till it's gone They pay paradise to put up a parking lot ba, 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 ooh, ba, ba, ba. They took all the trees and put them in a tree museum and They charged the people a dollar and a half to see it Don't it always seem to go you don't know what you got till it's gone They gave paradise to put up a parking lot Why not they pay paradise to put up a parking lot Hey farmer, farmer, put away your DTT I don't care about some spots and my apples Leave me the birds and the bees Please, don't it always seem to go you don't know what you got till it's gone. They paved paradise to put up a parking lot. Oh, yeah, they paved paradise to put up a parking lot. Late last night. 
Hit the door screen slam And a big yellow taxi took my baby away Don't it always seem to go That you don't know what you got till it's gone Open paradise and put up a parking lot Why not then pay paradise to put up a parking lot Oh yeah, they pay a parking lot Oh, what you wanna give What you wanna give What you wanna give it all away How you wanna give it I should wanna give it Now you wanna give it all away What you wanna give it I don't wanna give it What you wanna give it all away No, oh, why you wanna give it All up a parking lot They pay paradise to put up a parking lot Thank you. Our opening reading today is from Alice Wesley Blair from the Men's Lecture. If we are to have in our lives one community among all those of which we are a part, in which we can be honest through those sometimes conflicted hearts and minds, examine together our deepest loves, we need to examine together our deepest loves or by some misplaced, inappropriate love for less than worthy realities, so that we can try to see whether we are living by the right loves. The Free Church is an organization we establish and join so that we may help each other find over and over again in a thousand varying time frames and settings what are our worthiest loves, and therefore, what these loves require of us. Please join me now in a reading as we light the chalice. As we light the chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, we affirm our fifth principle, the right of conscience, and the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society at large. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Today's story is Lillian's Right to Vote by Jonah Winter and Shane W. Evans and adapted by Catherine Bonner. Lillian stands at the bottom of a very steep hill. It's voting day, and she's an American, and by God, she is going to vote. It is a long haul up that steep hill when you've been alive for a hundred years. It's a long haul when you've lived the life that Lillian has and walked so far in her shoes. When Lillian looks up, she sees more than just the blue sky, she sees history. She sees her great-grandparents, Elijah and Sarah, standing side by side on an auction block in front of the very same Alabama courthouse, where at that time only rich white men and no one else was allowed to vote. As Lillian starts her slow climb through the bright sunshine, she sees a dark time from years long past. She sees her great grandpa, Edmund, forced to pick cotton from daybreak to nightfall, right here in this country where it is written that all men are created equal. Well, he sure didn't have the right to vote, and nor would he be free until after the Civil War. She inched up the hill, passing her neighbor's house, but she sees her great-grandpa Edmund on his way to vote for the first time. 
thanks to the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, male American citizens' right to vote shall not be denied, abridged, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Lillian feels his dignity and pride as he and his wife Ada enter the courthouse for the first time. Oh, that hill is steep. Lillian knows that her grandpa Isaac was charged a poll tax to vote, a tax he didn't have the money to pay. She remembers the tests that her uncle Levi had to pass to vote. How many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? The registrar smirked. So much for the 15th Amendment. But Lillian pushes on, struggling to keep her balance. She sees a brave girl standing next to her mother and father after the 19th Amendment passed, giving women the right to vote. The girl is Lillian herself. She remembers the firm grip of her mother's hand as they ran from the angry mob chasing them. And she will always see the vivid orange and brilliant red of the burning cross set aflame by that same angry mob, just because her parents want to vote. Lillian stops, unable to keep going, and as she stands there, she recalls that blank piece of paper on which she must write down a section of the U.S. Constitution, word for word, as it is being mumbled by the registrar, a test she could not pass. No one could. Are you going to vote? She asks a young man who passes her on her route. Oh, yes, ma'am, he answers. Well, you better, she says, and she means it. Looking up to the top of the hill, Lillian wonders how she'll ever make it. It looks so far, and she is so tired. But though her feet and legs ache, what fuels her ancient body is remembering the hundreds of people marching from Selma to Montgomery to gain that right to vote. She keeps on climbing, keeps on seeing, and this time she sees the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who lifted people up with his words and still does. Step by footstep, she pushes forward. She remembers the third march from Selma to Montgomery. She sees them all, Martin Luther King, John Lewis, rabbis, priests, Unitarian Universalists, and 25,000 others. Lillian is there too. She still hears Reverend King asking how long they would have to wait for justice. Reaching the top of the hill, Lillian recalls the voice of President Lyndon Johnson as he signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. His words, every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. There is no duty which weighs more heavily on us than the duty we have to ensure that right. All of us must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice, and we shall overcome. So Lillian enters the building and steps into the voting booth. She sees herself stepping into the voting booth for the first time, and she knows that she would not be standing there if it were not for the courage of the people before her, the people who died, for her right to vote for her to exercise her right of conscience, for her to have a say. Lillian pushes the lever and votes. Our principles call us to make sure every voice is heard, that every voice is valued, that everyone has a right to vote without fear of reprisal. Let us heed this call and ensure democracy stands. I now invite up the children and teens to join their teachers in the classrooms. Thank you. And if you are new here, no worries. I will help you find your way. Thank you.
but I won't back down. No, I stand my ground. Won't be pushed around. And I keep this world from dragging me down. Cause I won't back down. No, I won't back down. I won't back down, baby. There are no easy way out. I won't back down. I, I will stand my ground. And I won't back down. Well, I know what's right, and I got just one life in a world that keeps on pushing me down. No, I won't back down, and I will. Stand my ground. I won't back down, baby. There are no easy way out. I won't back down. I, I will stand my ground, and I won't back down. I won't back down, baby. There ain't no easy way out. I won't back down. I, I will stand my ground. I won't back down, baby. There ain't no easy way out. I won't back down. I will stand my ground, and I won't back down. Thank you. Our centering in words today are entitled Freedom. Freedom, oh freedom, what can you see at the dawn's early light we once proudly held, but the light's barely bright. We cannot silently watch as the barriers are breached for our freedom to shine. We must remember to teach. The attacks on the airwaves, the red lines have been crossed. Will our freedom still be there, or will it be lost? Oh, say our values call us to never be slaves. Oh, to be the land of the free. We must be the home of the brave. As we go into our time of silence now, I invite you to contemplate what you can do for, to ensure that our freedoms will continue for the next generation and generations to come.
compromise and conscience. In some ways, together, they seem like an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp or political science or uh, something relating maybe to, the, to today's topic slightly, the phrase civil war. Can you have a war that is civil? Really? I, I don't know. Can these two concepts, compromise and conscience, live together? You know, as we spoke earlier, democracy is one of our core principles of our faith. We find honor in the right of conscience, right? The willingness to stand up for what we think is right despite the consequences. This right of conscience is part of our Unitarian Universalist history, having been described, having been descended from a long line of religious dissenters. We differed with religious and societal orthodoxy throughout history and stood up and said loudly and proudly what we believed. Still, we try to balance conscience with being effective in reaching our goals, which sometimes does require compromise. Our original Unitarian Universalist principles were formed out of a compromise between the Unitarians and the Universalists when they consolidated in 1961 to form the Unitarian Universalist Association. And although they agreed on many, many things, they differed on some very important issues, at least to them at that time and place. One of those issues that was a thorn uh, in the side was whether to include the name of Jesus in the principles. And in the end, each group compromised on many different issues, the most important point being that they continued to work together until they could come up with a resolution to their challenges. And because they, were, they did this because they were able to see a higher, more important cause for both groups. And so they worked late, late until the night, like three in the morning, the night before the vote. And uh, for those who are curious, Jesus was not included in our original principles. But they sat and they heard each other's concerns and they tried to reconcile it with theirs. And of course, this is easier when all see and understand and agree with that, that sort of higher, uh, more important cause. It's easier to find compromise if both parties have similar values, uh, but perhaps have different perspectives on how to achieve living out those values. I think Unitarian Universalists live fully into compromise due to our pluralistic theology. Right? We can see it even in our Sunday services. Some Sunday's topics might have more of a focus on Christianity, others on Buddhism, others on Judaism, and often, as, as many of them are, as in my second reflection later, um, are often uh, based on our personal experiences in the world, all trying to make meaning of our life and this world. Our music as well includes a diversity of genres and styles. And I know, as some of you have shared with me, not everybody loves all the different aspects of worship. But more importantly, you love and care for each other. Right? It's important to each of us that others in our community find meaning, even if it may not be the way we find meaning in that moment. Right? We find our unity in our diversity and our plurality, in our radical acceptance of others, in our relationships with each other. It becomes, though, more challenging when we are confronted with those whose values are very different than our own. And I still think it's important to be civil with everyone we encounter. They are still our neighbors. I will never understand how 
some of my neighbors and even some of my old friends, many of whom I know are intelligent people, come to the decisions they do about political issues. It's just mind-boggling to me. What I have found helpful, whether it is talking to neighbors or friends or at school boards, though, is to share why I believe what I believe and what my religious values are that underpin those decisions. Because the truth is no one is ever convinced of anything just telling them they are wrong about it, right? But sharing our stories, our religious values requires us to understand the religious values underpinning our decisions. And there are some people in the larger community who spew vitriol and, and take action that co act causes actual harm to others. They want laws that silence and eliminate others from the public sphere, those who disagree with them. But if the only voices in the public square that are heard are the minority of conservative Christian voices, then that is what the public will believe religious people think. We must speak out and stand our ground and espouse our values and beliefs in public so that the world knows that there are other religious views and those people who, to whom religion is an important aspect of their life can have a different view of what religion might say. It is my values of justice and equity that cause me to speak out and work for including the full breadth of BIPOC studies in our schools. Yeah, I just finished reading Killers of the Flower Moon about basically white people who killed many of the Osage indigenous peoples in Oklahoma and stole most of their wealth in the early 20th century. And they went mostly unpunished. Stories like this in the Tulsa race riots, I did not learn in school myself. I learned them only because somebody in Hollywood decided to make a movie about it. And I went to Unitarian Universalist anti-racism classes that told stories about these things, right? So it's important that these be taught, that we become educated. It's the, my value of love and belonging that caused me to speak and work for LGBTQIA rights. It is the value of interdependence that caused me to speak uh, on work on issues of environmental sustainability. It's my values of privacy and religious freedom, freedom that caused me to speak out and work on issues of reproductive justice. I have said this numerous times. The, the issue of reproductive justice is a theological one, and our government should not be making theological decisions for women. <laughs> These. These are the high and more important causes our country should work for. And lastly, I want to say it is my value of generosity that calls me week after week after week to ask you to donate to our offering. Please be as generous as you can. For those online or those here on a cell phone, there is a link and a QR code. Let this sacred time begin.
Our next reading is a responsive reading, the free mind. I call that mind free which masters the senses and which recognizes its own reality and greatness. Which masters life, not in asking what it shall be the greater, but in hungering, thirsting, and desiring what it shall be I call that mind free which jealously guards its intellectual rights and powers, which does not content itself with a passive or hereditary faith. I call that, that mind free which is not passively framed by outward circumstances and is not the creature of accidental impulse. I call that mind free which protects itself against the usurpations of society and which does not cower to human opinion. I call that mind free which resists the bondage of habit which does not mechanically copy the past nor live on its old virtues. I call that mind free which has cast off all fear but that of wrongdoing, and which no menace or peril can enthrall. And now, once more, breathe, Rivera. Get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight, no. Get up, stand up, get up for your rights. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Preacher man, don't tell me. Heaven is under the earth I know you don't know My life, it's really worth Is it all that glitter is gold? Half the story ain't never been told So now you see the light, yeah Stand up for your right Come on now, say Get up, stand up Stand up for your right Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. Don't give it up. Don't give it up. Get up, stand up. Turn up for your friends. Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. Most people think great God will come from the sky. Take everything away. And make everybody feel high But if you don't know what life is worth You can look for your son earth Now you see the light So stand up for your right Come on now and get up Stand up Stand up for your right Whoa. Get up, stand up Don't give up the fight Get up, stand up, stand up for your right. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight.
night yeah. You're sick and tired of your essence Kissing, game, dying And I'm gonna hang in Jesus' name yeah. We know when we understand Almighty God is a living man You can fool from people sometimes You cannot fool all the people all the time And now you see the light so get up for your right. Come on now, get up, stand up. Get up for your right. That's right. Get up, stand up. Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. Don't give it up. Don't give it up. Get up, stand up. Oh yeah. Get up for your right. Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. One more time with me. Let's go. Get up, stand up, get up for your rights, get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Thank you. Woo. Well, I was a young boy. On a hot summer's day, my family would go to a beach club in the South Bronx. They had numerous sports facilities and, of course, numerous pools as well throughout the complex. We would get there at 8 in the morning, and all the parents would you know, pick a spot, set their chairs, and then all the children would just go run wild for the whole day, returning only when we were hungry. I don't know that I would ever let my children do that, knowing what I know <laughs> about me, anyway. <laughs> but I would immediately, you know, my parents always want me to stay in like the small wading pool, but I was a good swimmer, so I always headed to the center of the complex where the deepest pool was. And in the center of that pool was a large rectangular platform that rose high into the air. And I remember the first time I had the courage to go climb up that platform to jump. It is, and I just want to say, it's one thing, right, to dive from the end of a pool. You know, you know about how deep it is. You know, you know how far you're going to dive. You feel pretty safe about it. But um, you have more control over, over what's going to happen. But the climb up the long ladder itself was harrowing itself. Right, the water-tinged runs led me to imagine myself slipping, falling, and hurting myself, because that's what I did when I was a kid, always imagine those things. Um, but upon reaching the top of the platform, although knowing nothing about physics as an eight-year-old, I will nonetheless try to start calculating the speed and velocity of me falling into the ground, the depth of the water, and trying to calculate all of that and wondering if this is how my young life was going to end. <laughs> now, the only thing that overcame my fear was that there was somebody else behind me who, if I didn't jump, would have pushed me in. Um, and so, I, when it was my turn, I got up there, and I just jumped. And I hur as I hurtled through the air, it was both fearful and exciting, and exhilarating. I mean, and then as I hit the water, I held my breath for as long as I could as I sunk deep into the waters, never touching the bottom. It was a deep pool, or I was very short. I'm not sure which. <laughs> As I get older, I think it was more because I was short. But, um, but slowly I rose up from the seamless, bottomless pool, my arms and feet working hard to reach the surface. No breath ever felt so good as the air that I breathed when I broke the surface of that water. Once again realizing that I would live for another jump. But then I realized the real danger as I looked up into the sky and I saw the next jumper hurtling right down towards me. <laughs> now that experience has served me well as I think back on my life. It's a good metaphor for all of our lives, our religious lives, our congregational lives, and our lives uh, as participants in this grand experiment called democracy. We can sit 
and sit safely in the shallow water, playing it safe, or we can dare to go into the deep end, into the unknown, not knowing what the depths will lead us to. We will be challenged by physical and mental limitations, some real, some imagined. Only, though, by going into the deep end of the pool can we come to know our own abilities and potentials. Only by risking the comfort of what is known can we become aware of what is possible. And the more we do this, the deeper we go, the easier it gets each time. But you have to have the courage to jump in. And after enough times, then it will become a habit. And after you catch your breath, you do need to look back and still see what's coming, right? What worked? What didn't work? How do we have to adapt going forward? You know, the founders of the United States in 1798 ratified the Constitution of the United States. Its preamble, as many of you may know, goes, and I quote, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America, end quote. Now, the greatest act the founders of our country um, did is that they created a mechanism that allows the Constitution to be changed as our culture changes. But it requires people to be engaged deeply in the process. If we put our heads down, if we don't, uh, if we don't look up to see what's coming, it can and has been corrupted, and we are and will be harmed as individuals and as a nation. From its very inception, the founders were prescient enough to know that the words merely represented a dream for America. It starts, we the people, even though the Constitution and many of its writers uh, know it was originally written by and for white landowners. And they considered African Americans property and women second class citizens. Unitarian minister Theodore Parker in 1850 spoke about this aspiration of the founders. And I point out, you'll, you'll probably recognize some of the words that he spoke this 13 years before Gettysburg uh, when Lincoln spoke similar words. Parker called it an American idea. And he says, and I quote, this idea demands as the proximate organization thereof, they talked like that back then, a democracy that is a government of all the people, by all the people, for all the people. Of course, a government after the principles of eternal justice the unchanging law of God, for shortness sake, I will call it the idea of freedom, end quote. So you'll notice Lincoln in his Gettysburg speech took out the all in all of those, but, but Parker in his religious view believed it all people mattered, right? Of course, now, we won't get into the all versus some, but I mean, because people were being excluded. He wanted those who were excluded to be included. And so what do we mean by freedom? Of course, freedom is a relative term, right? We're not free to do anything we want in the world, at least not without consequences. Uh, when I am speeding and the police officer gives me a ticket, I was free to speed, but, you know, I, he was also free to give me a ticket. Um, we as a society, or even as a congregation, make rules all the time limiting our freedom, right? So what time you come to service, right? You don't 
You don't have a choice about that. We, we set the time. Right, the first line. So what does this have to do with religion, though, that you, you might be thinking? I know I was thinking that when I wrote this. <laughs> the first line of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights reads, and I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And in Article 6, it states, no religious test shall ever be required, ever, as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So clearly, this was meant not to be a Christian nation. The founders of our country had seen the devastation that state religions had wrought in Europe. They felt people should have the free expression, expression of their religious beliefs. And the founders of the United States understood this, and particularly our third and fourth presidents, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, fought hard for the First Amendment with the goal to, project, to protect religious minorities. Thomas Jefferson, in a letter to Danbury Baptist, I think it was early 1800 and something, um, compared the First Amendment to, and I quote, building a wall of separation between church and state, adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, end quote. That was the first time the phrase separation of church and state was publicly applied to the First Amendment and clearly shows the writer's intent, separation of church and state. Now, there are those today however, who are creating laws in this country to impose their narrow religious views on the entirety of the country. They say they create these laws in the name of freedom. The Don't Say Gay Bill is actually entitled Florida Parental Rights. The Anti-Critical Race Theory Bill is actually entitled Individual Freedom Bill. But I ask you whose rights and whose freedom are they talking about, right? Not freedom, they're not talking about freedom for all people, they are just talking about freedom for a small group of white Christian nationalists drumming up fear and hatred. Is the child in school who hasn't eaten anything in two days free to learn if they are starving? If a transgender individual cannot get health or medical care, are they free to live their life fully? If young students, both white and BIPOC, are not allowed to learn the full history of our country, are they, and is this country free to reach our potential? Teachers and doctors are being censored in this state, and that is not freedom. Hear, hear, hear right. Theologian Karen Armstrong wrote, religion is not something you just read about. It's something you do, like swimming. Articles on swimming don't mean anything until you get in the water. So I encourage you to jump in the deep end of the pool. Your footing, it may feel slippery at first, but what awaits you may be unknown. It is both fearful and exhilarating, I promise you. And we know that if we are truly going to be free, freedom means responsibility. Responsibility for our religious lives, responsibility for our congregation, and responsibility for our country. So what will you do? I invite you to invite yourselves, your friends, your families, your neighbors into deeper conversation, into deeper action, as we head to that freedom land. I invite you to the inaugural meeting of the Democracy Action Team on Thursday, February 22nd, from 4 to 5.30, as we plan our first actions to live out our values and save democracy. Yes, we can save democracy. As the song said, we don't know what we've got till it's gone. Well, I, let's, not find at, let's not find that out. And the last message I want to give you is the message from the Russian dissident, Alexei Navalny, prior to his death. 
in a Russian prison, and he actually recorded something that if he died, he wanted played. And in it, he said, you are not allowed to give up. So for the sake of democracy and our values, we are not allowed to give up. I ask you now to come and go with me to that land of freedom, that land of religious freedom, freedom for all people, not just for the select few, for all people. I am on my way, and if you want to join me, you can rise and body and spirit and start singing loudly our hymn, Come and Go With Me to That Land Where We're Bound. <laughs> Closing words are from the Reverend Clarence Russell Skinner from the Social Implications of Universalism. The fight for freedom is never won. Inherited liberty is never, is not liberty but tradition. Each generation must win for itself the right to emancipate itself from its own tyrannies, which are ever precedented and peculiar. Therefore, those who have been reared in freedom bear a tremendous responsibility to the world to win an ever larger and more important freedom. Please join me now in extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you all for your presence here today. Thank you. Go out and do well. Do good. <laughs>
anything, Doug?